Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, best-selling author and multifamily land baron, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? Jake, I'm doing good. You forgot one thing. Father of six kids. You father, always say that. Father of six kids. All right, we got it. What else? What else not, you got? Not much. I'm, I'm ready to jump on this call right now. Let's get going. All right. Today, we're going to introduce the manage right portion of the Wheelbarrow Profits Framework and discuss whether or not you should self-manage or partner with a property management company. We're also going to discuss how we reposition mom-and-pop apartments for big bucks. So, Gino, let's jump right in. Um, Jake, what do you, to you, what do you think manage right means? Give the audience your, you know, your, your thoughts, your views of when I say, Jake, let's manage right. What does that mean to you? Well, manage right to me means meeting or surpassing our specific income and expense numbers. I say this a lot. Multifamily investing is not rocket science. There's uh, people out there that you know simply are winning and doing well because they're in multifamily, not because they're geniuses or anything. And at the end of the day, it comes down to income versus expenses like any business. So manage right to me, again, means meeting or surpassing our specific income and expense numbers and hitting our monthly goals. If you don't mind, let me expand a little bit on that. Uh, we've had this journey, you mean you, this incredible journey in the last, I guess, two and a half to three years. When we first started out, we had zero units. Manage right to me meant collect the rents, put some money in your pocket. You know, you get your first property, you say, wow, I got to manage right. What does that mean? It's sort of the same thing. You're running around like a chicken without a head, right? Collecting rents, trying to pay the bills, but you know the biggest word that I can convey to people in this call is systems. We had very little systems in place, and we're buying from mom and pops who had no systems. So uh, the managed portion of the systems in our program is crucial. If you don't have great systems in your manage right, you're not going to succeed, especially if you want to get to be big. So you know when you start small. You have to think with the goal in mind of you want to get big. The quicker you can get, the bigger you are, the more money you're going to make. So when you're small, start implementing those systems. And that's why I got Jake on the call here because Jake's got a great mind for systems. We're building our systems out, and that's what creates value. Because what happens is once you start to get big like us, you know, I wouldn't say we're big, but we're up to 500 units um, in three years, which I think has been to me, incredible because I've been doing this for 15 years and I was stuck in the mud for so many years and all of a sudden the light bulb went on. I met a couple of terrific partners. We had the same mindset, different skills, and it just all clicked. And one thing led to another, momentum, and it just it just took off. But the thing that's been making us really successful in the last 18 months, I can't re replicate Jake. There's only one Jake Senziano. So we have to build systems to be able to replicate Jake be able to have Jake, you know, hire people. To be able to have Jake train people. So when Jake isn't there, you know, it's still functioning properly. So I hope that this call will bring that to you, and we'll be able to, you know, offer some advice and show you how we're building our systems and how we're, quote unquote, managing right. Absolutely, and it's uh, it's the common thing that everyone hears when they're talking about scalability, and that's working on your business and not in your business. That was something that I struggled with a lot in the beginning. I had the I'm a mentality. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Right. I'm going to do everything because I'm going to save a couple bucks. I'm a, That's I'm right. a, I'm a. And then you start realizing, you know, you don't have 15 arms. You can't do it all yourself. So that's when I started to slow down a little bit and look to really put systems in place, scale the business up, put the right partners in place to do the jobs, and we actually make more money now uh, than we did. It's it's really interesting. I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. No, you can't. You're just but Jake, you're one I, person. I don't discourage people from starting Ama Ama because, you know, when you did Ama Ama and I did Ama Ama, you get the experience. No, uh, it's priceless. 
You, you know what I'm but saying? You can't so, do it forever. When you're still no, scaling. you can't. No, you can't. So I think that if you're starting as a beginning investor, I think you should manage your properties in the very beginning. All these gurus are going to tell you, "Oh, you're going to manage your company," and that's fine. You know, it works for them. But I always think that everybody should start out and say, "Listen, hire." Hire a management company after you run your properties a little bit. Get the experience so you know how to run the properties. You know how to build your systems. Once you've got that all in place, then the step is to maybe look for a management company if that's I your goal. I completely agree because now we fully understand the business and we're not investing this into something that we don't understand. We know the ins and outs and it's really important to to understand your business to that level. And we do now. So I think that's really uh been something that's helped us and contributed to our success. But what's great about that also is that once you're managing your own properties, you're going to develop your own systems. You're going to hire a management company and you're going to train that management company to run the, the property the way you want it run. And you know what? That management company might bring on some of their own systems that are great. You can blend them together. Put them together and see what works best. But if you don't know how to collect a ten, a rent from a tenant, if you don't know how to do a credit or background check, or if you don't know how to evict a tenant, you don't have those systems in place. When you get a management company, they might not be doing it properly either. So it's always a good idea to start out and to you know take your lumps in the beginning. Let's jump right into this you know this repositioning of mom and pop properties. Uh, Jake, why don't you start out and tell everybody how we do this, how we came up with this? I, I call it a pretty simple framework. Um, like you said, it's not rocket science, but there's just a couple of really simple basic steps you really have to nail, and you can just continue to replicate it once you really learn the system. Yeah. So this framework was just developed from what we were currently doing and we learned it after we did a few properties and then we we started to put it into a framework and this is a now our system for repositioning and Gino was talking about systems we've actually put this in this is our repositioning framework this is a system we use every time we go into a new uh, mom and pop property that we purchased and again if this is your first time listening to one of these podcasts when we say mom and pop size doesn't matter we've bought 25 unit mom and pops we bought 281 unit mom and pops so we bought some larger properties and we bought some smaller ones but they all had the same uh, mom and pop uh, failings uh, no systems in place deferred maintenance etc so jumping into our framework the first step in our repositioning f- framework is to fill the vacant units at market rents many times we take over these mom and pop properties and we've had as many as 20 to 30 vacancies we use rentometer.com. Rentometer is going to give us the market rates, market rents for that area. And once we do that, we're going to take those units, we're going to go in, we're going to get a nice modern paint scheme, we're going to make sure the, the carpets or the flooring is in check, make sure the cabinets are looking good. We call it a modern afford- uh, modern affordability. That's, our, that's our, our tag word for that. We go in, get the apartments looking good, and then we rent them out at market rates. We've seen anywhere from... 150 to 175 dollars a month jumps immediately so we go in we fill the vacant units at market from there we implement rubs which is ratio utility billing systems basically what we do is we build the tenants back for their sewer water and garbage uh, typically in our market it's about 30 to 35 dollars per tenant so as we go through you can't do it to the people that are currently on leases but the ones that are not on leases and the new renters coming in we add that to those tenants. Uh, once, once we're out about a year, we fill the vacant units in market and continue to do that. We've implemented our rubs. We then go through and raise the remaining tenants to market rents. So we've gone, filled the vacant units, implemented the rubs. Now it's time to go through, and all those people that we acquired through the acquisition, we're going to go through and raise those folks to market rents and make sure we have rubs on board there. So that is our three-step process to repositioning mom-and-pop apartments. It doesn't stop there, though, because there's other things to do on the outside of the property, such as deferred maintenance. Gino, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, let me jump in real quick uh, and take them a step back. This is all going to be achievable only if you buy right. If you didn't hear the first podcast – Go back and listen to the buy right because Jake is talking about how do you get a $150 a month bump in rents. Well, these mom and pops are burned out. They've been running these properties. Jake likes to call it the death spiral. They've been running these properties. They haven't been raising these rents. They just haven't been doing any of this maintenance. So they're happy that the tenants are paying whatever they're paying. 
Um, we love to see these opportunities, and they're all over the place. You drive around, you see these properties that need a little tender loving care. That's what you have to focus on. That's where the value is. Um, we've, like Jake said, we picked up properties that are eighty percent occupied. There's a twenty percent vacancy in there. There is a ton of value there. What we do first of all is we look for demand. If there's demand in the market, and we look at what everyone else is going with the with the vacancy rate in the market is if there's a 5% vacancy rate and we've got a 20%, we know there's tremendous value there. We look for the job growth, make sure there's jobs in the area. We like to, you know, buy where there people are employed. That's a key for this strategy. Uh, Jake had touched on rubs. Make sure that your market, that all your competition is doing rubs. Fortunately for us, most of our market utilizes rubs. So when we see one of these mom and pops that aren't utilizing rubs, that is a home run for us. Let me give you a quick number. When we took over a property that had 136 units, they weren't doing rubs. Everyone else was. All we did was simply utilize a $30 a month bill back on 136 units. If you do the math on that, I'll do quickly right now. It's 3000 and what It's about 4000 bucks a month. No, we did 35 Gino. It's closer to five. So five thirty a month, yeah. Okay, so five thousand a month. So I'm going to break that down to you. Five thousand a month is sixty thousand dollars a year. At a simple ten cap rate, it's going to be six hundred thousand dollars in value that we created just from implementing rubs. I mean, if you think about that, that's at a ten cap. That right there is unbelievable. And these these landlords are leaving that money on the table. And you know what? Tenants expect that. It, I, I think it's great. Once you implement the rubs, all of a sudden your water bills start to go down because they know they're paying for it. They're on the hook for it. It's actually been shown and proven that once rubs is, in, is installed or a tenant begins to pay their own utilities, utilities and especially water can drop by as much as 60%. So it's actually a savings to your own water bill also, which is great. Um, and raise the remaining tenants. Tenants know that once they see stuff is going on on the property, me and Jake don't mean to go in there and start raising rents and start you know, being cutthroat landlords. But what happens is you add value, you create value, you expect those rents to go up. And tenants expect it. They're gonna, what they're going to do is they're going to call around to your competition. And if you're renting an apartment for four fifty a month and they've been there for the last four years – they're going to call their competition and go, well, how much is a two-bedroom? Well, their competition is going to say, well, it's $600 a month. So when you raise yours from four fifty to $600, they are going to get sticker shock. But you're going to say to them, listen, I just painted. I just did the landscaping. I just did the hallways. They're going to know that. But they're going to need some justification. So when we say raise the remaining you know, tenants, you have to create value to them. Give them value. Our maintenance department is, I think, one of the main reasons why we're able to do this. Uh I love the story that Jake told me when we first took over that big property. You know, a tenant came into the office. He was crying because no one had fixed his stove. It had been six months since somebody fixed his stove. They called us up, maintenance. We got the guy out. It's all about service and about servicing the tenants and creating value. Once you do that, this framework is going to work for you because you can, you can raise those raise those rents. Yeah, a lot of little things we do is uh, there's breezeways in a lot of our properties. Um, there's you know a lot of flower beds and and whatnot. So we'll go through. We'll paint the the downspouts. We'll add shutters. Uh, any kind of exterior trim, we'll paint it. Uh, make sure the bushes are trimmed. Make sure the grass is cut. Go through, stripe the driveways. All these little things that add curb appeal. Make sure the the mailboxes are in good shape if there's outside mailboxes or if there's a centralized mailbox. Um, different, make sure common areas, new signage, make sure the outdoor lighting is working, any uh, fence railing repairs, uh, door hardware, any of these little things that are going to add curb appeal. You don't want any ugly uh, window dressings. Uh, a lot of times you'll see the, in bad apartment complexes, a bunch of busted up mini blinds. We make, they're, Look, they're inexpensive. Fix them, replace them, because it shows from the outside. Um, you know, we also do uh, washer dryers through uh, different companies that come in and replace and actually add all new washer dryers to our apartment complexes, and that's a, a profit uh, split. These are different things that go on in that first year to reposition the property. It's not just about what's going on with an increase in the income, but as we're increasing the income, we're actually going through fixing up the property as well 
and make, making sure that our expenses, we're keeping our ex- expenses as low as possible. Um, great example is we actually saved over $20,000 by renegotiating garbage contracts on that same 136-unit property that Gina was talking about. That was a tremendous savings. We took that money, we put it back in the property, you know, continue to fix it up, and tenants respond. They like to see that. Let's talk about a couple other expenses. I know one was we're installing the photo cells for the lights outside. Um, you know, utilities is, is, is a high expense. We want to we want to lower that. Um, our insurance expense we we farm that out every year. As you get larger, you start bundling properties together. Great way to save on your expenses. Um, another one is the uh, landscaping. You can talk to them about the landscaping. How you know we're getting bids. Um, you know, talk to them about a couple of the ways we we save on expenses, Jake. Yeah, one of the most important things is to get three bids uh, from anybody that you're going to partner with, whether it's a sign guy, whether it's whether it's the landscaper, or it's your plumber. So anytime you do it, make sure you're getting multiple bids mm-hmm. for any of this stuff. That way you, you can cho- pick and choose. And then as you, your team starts to grow, you start to say, okay, this guy is a winner, that guy's a loser. You get rid of the losers, and you stick with the winners, and then you get recommendations from them as well. So you, you actually will find a group that's – totally supportive and provides value for you. Uh, just recently, we hit on all cylinders because it's tough. As you know, we're managing these properties ourselves. It's You're not always going to have all your different uh, contractors that are working for you. They're not always going to be winners. I call them the 80%ers. If they're only giving us 80% and they're not giving us 100%, I get rid of them because we just don't have the time to deal with bad attitudes. So you do that, you get rid of the, the dead weight, and you move on until you, you find somebody that's going to fit, and you stick with them for the long haul. That has been one of the things that has really helped us as well. Uh, another thing that's really helped us on these properties, you know, when you talk about managing, we talk about fees. Uh, a lot of fees and money has been left on the table. We, we refer it to rubs. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that we love to charge. Uh, half the population, at least the tenant population, around half – own pets. A lot of landlords don't like to rent to pets. We rent to pets and we get pet fees. We get pet deposits. That's a huge revenue generator for us. And Another a monthly, one, monthly increase charge as well. It's not just the, the upfront fee. It's a monthly fee as well. Monthly, yeah. I mean, uh, another one of late fees. Someone comes into the office. You know, We don't like to charge late fees, but it sets a precedent. If you guys have a system in place where a tenant is late, it's just – I mean, it's you're running a business. I always tell Jake, I always tell my other partners, if somebody's late, I go to the bank, I say to the bank, I'm sorry, bank, I'm late. The bank doesn't really care if I'm late or not. I'm running a business. So you have to decide for yourself if you're running a charity event or you're running a business. If you're running a business, I highly recommend charging late fees so their priority is to pay on time so you can pay on time your maintenance, you can pay your staff, you can pay the bank. So late fees are a great way to generate money and also to set the precedent. Um, Application fees is another great place to generate fees. Uh, Another one we have is storage. If you have any storage on the property – Rent out storage to tenants. Tenants love to store stuff. We like I like to say they, they like to store crap. And once their crap is there, they're not leaving for that little nuisance bump in rent. So that's another great way to uh, generate revenue. You can, th- can you think of any other, Jake? Well, I want to touch on the late fees a little bit because we talked about systems. We talked about scalability. We use property management software. And every month, that property management software auto-generates the late fees. So it puts it right on the tenant's ledger. So that way, when the letter goes out to the tenant, they're they're seeing that late fee, and it's it's the computer's doing the work. It's not people doing the work. So on the sixth of every month, boom, thirty bucks goes out to the tenant, and that's a nice little revenue generator too. We don't want the people paying late, but we'll take the the additional fee if they do. So, so we do we do pet fees, we do application fees. Application fees can be great because that's another one to negotiate. We typically charge forty dollars per application fee, but the the application actually costs us about fifteen. So make sure that when you're negotiating, even with the uh, the tenant screening companies, that we get nationwide background checks, we get credit uh, credit criminal, all that uh, for fifteen dollars. So if they're trying to charge you thirty, if you get big enough, you can negotiate and beat that down. So that's one that's a little tip there as well. But uh, we actually charge, uh, where we are, move-in fees. We do not charge uh, security deposits. We actually charge a fee to move in that's non-refundable, that's equivalent to what other uh, places in the area are charging for deposits. That's another fee we charge. 
I, I like to talk to people today, right now about you know what needs to be fixed on the property. You, you touched on this really quickly. I, I think one of the most important things with the mom and pop property uh, <clears throat> that you really want to touch on is you really want to touch on the branding of the property. You want to touch on the stigma of the property because these properties have been run down. They just don't have that good feel to them. So one of the first things that we like to do, we like to if it if it needs to, we like to rename the property and just put all new signage out. It just gives a new feel. Under new management, they know things are happening, they know things are going on. It's not terribly expensive to do that. Total branding, you get the website up and running. It's just a great feel for the for the community. Yeah, it's a it's a signal, it's a sign to the tenants that things are changing and there's a new company in town. And if they're going to take care of me, if you're doing a good job, you're taking care of them. It's just it. It also helps to retain tenants that are currently there because maybe they're starting to get burnt out and sick of the prior management. But if someone new comes in, they'll say, hey, maybe we'll give these guys a shot and see how they'll do. Jake, what else do you think sticks out of your mind that we normally like to take over and we like like to attack as far as deferred maintenance? What sticks out to you? Well, it's, it's really – it's funny because we got to start on the insides because – once you go into a unit, you got to look at the floors, make sure the floors are in good condition, and then we like to do two-tone paint schemes and change the light fixtures. So that's the day one when we go in. That's the stuff we're looking at because you got to get the insides of the, the apartments looking good if you're going to rent them because that's where your pictures go up online, and that's where the tenant's going to be living. Uh, immediately after that, we start to go to the common areas, the hallways and whatnot where people are going, and then we start to work our way to the outsides. We don't obviously like to have someone pull up if we got a mom and pop and the outside, you know, there might be uh, a gutter that's hanging off or there might be cobwebs. We, we start attacking that stuff immediately too, but we definitely start to work from the inside out a little bit because that's where the tenant's going to be living. But And the transformation that you can do with a little bit of paint – and some shutters is is incredible. I mean, we bought a 36 unit property. I remember buying it and seeing it and then coming down two months later after we had done all the railings and had done all the doors and the shutters a certain color. It was, it, I mean, it's transformational what you can do with some paint and some power washing. So uh, that's something that we love to do. Um, take care of that outside because once people pull in, they have about a three second. You know, you can you only have one chance to make a first impression. So if you make that bad impression, you're not going to be able to rent the place. But if you can really fix it up outside and clean it up, and we're not talking about ripping windows out and redoing siding and all that. You know, we like to buy brick buildings, but if there's siding on there, we power wash the siding. The siding is fine. We don't have to change it. Uh, we love to put shutters down. Shutters give a great look, and we love to do that. You know, that dark color. We like to put black on shutters black on doors it really pops out really stands out with that red brick that we have on a lot of our properties yep it looks great and fortunately for us in our market there was a hailstorm a few years ago so most of the roofs in the in the market got replaced so we've been snagging up a bunch of brick apartment buildings with brand new roofs so it's been a lot of uh, little things paint pressure washing etc so we've talked a lot about how we reposition these properties. Uh, we talked about the framework to fill the vacants at market, the rubs, the raise the remaining, and the things we fix when we go in. Gino, why don't you talk to them a little bit about a real life case study, Park Place Apartments, and what that where that went to from in the beginning to where we repositioned it and refinanced it. Uh, sure, we've been touching about on about this property uh, for the last twenty or thirty minutes. It was basically our our first really big mom and pop and it was owned by a doctor so you wouldn't think a doctor it would be a mom and pop but it's not the property it's the way the property is being managed um we got really fortunate in a couple of instances with this property it, it was in good shape it didn't need that much work they needed you know some painting they needed power washing they needed a little bit of work on the driveways um we were very fortunate that two miles down the road there was a a manufacturing place that has 4,000 employees. So there's a ton of demand there. So when I was looking at the property, I was saying to myself, how do they have 80% occupancy when there's 4,500 jobs down the street? And lo and behold, she had this crazy way of trying to fill up these apartments with these credit checks that people just couldn't, they, could, they couldn't pass her credit checks. So a lot of these apartments were vacant. They had five apartments out of 136 they were using as storage or just as basically vacant. So those are five units 
at 600 bucks a month, that's another three grand a month that they were just leaving on the table. Um, they were renting these apartments out for 450 for a two bedroom and 495 for a three bedroom. And, you know, I asked the broker, we weren't even sure. I couldn't even believe this. He's like, you can get 595 every day of the week. And we were a little hesitant about it. I was just saying to Jake, if we could just fill these things up, we have a home run here. Uh, and with the rubs, the same thing. It, it was just all fell right into place. 136 units with no rubs on it. It was just, it was actually amazing to me that they weren't charging it. Um, they were truly running it like a mom and pop operation. Part of the reason that they weren't filling up the units either is because they were not offering value. Uh, n- nothing was painted. The breezeways mm-hmm. looked like bombs went off. The, the, they were whitewashing the entire apartments. The rugs were old and beat up. They were just not reinvesting anything into the property. Um, when we were looking at it in, initially, they did. They were doing fifty three thousand a month, and we purchased the property for four million seventy five. Uh, within a year, we got the income up to eighty four thousand, and we actually refied. Uh, we did a refinance for uh, and the property reappraised for six point three million. That's the power of this repositioning system. You took a property day one, you bought it for four million seventy five. Then, within a year, it reappraised for six point three million dollars. That's a huge jump. I couldn't believe it. But, you know, we we got the income up, and it was based on the income approach. So, proofs in the pudding. Well, there's a couple of things that is really great about this and what I want people to, to realize. You don't have to find a property that's totally destroyed and do your fixer J uh, on it. You don't have to go there and totally revamp the whole property, rip out cabinets. And that's not what you want because that is a lot of work. It's going to take a long time. There's so much more risk involved. There's so many of these deals out there that me and Jake are talking about or alluding to that that's what you really want to focus on because – Time is of the essence. We want to rent these things out quickly. If the cabinets are okay, we're not ripping the cabinets out. We're going to reface the cabinets, we're going to repaint them, and we're going to reuse them. You know, Jake and I like to uh, really focus our attention on C properties in B kind of areas. So this is what this was. You know, it was a C property, but it's in a C plus B minus area. So we're repositioning it to a higher property class, and we're not you doing a ton of work on the property. So. The goal here is to find a property that you don't need to spend years and years and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of capital, dollars of capital to reposition it. All the meanwhile, we're cash flowing on this property fantastically for the first year, reinvesting the money into it, getting it up to snuff. So when we went to refinance it, the appraiser would come out and go, oh, wow, you guys did a little bit of painting. This looks good. Uh, the office looked fantastic. So you really want to focus on these kinds of properties where you don't have to do a total overhaul on it because it's going to take a lot more time and it's going to take a lot more money. And also, there's going to be a lot. you need a lot more experience on this. You're going to be on the job all the time fixing these places up. And it's going to take a lot longer to do. And you're going to need a lot more time to rent these places out. Yeah. But it was just it was so amazing to me that we took a place and within one year – we were able to create over $2 million in value and pull it out. Uh, and once the uh, property was refinanced, it was still cash flowing greater than 10%. It's just I could not believe it. It really opened my eyes to a lot of things after the Park Place deal. Well, the funny thing about the whole scenario there was we have a lot of apartments around the area. So what happened was as soon as our rents started going up, lo and behold, the rest of the neighborhood – Rents were going up. So as our ships were rising with the tide, everyone else's was also. So that's the power of what you can do when you turn an apartment complex or an apartment community around and you start adding value. Rents are going to go up, and that's what happened in this scenario. Yeah, it just was – It was. Uh, we, wor- we worked really hard, uh, but we, did, we earned uh, every penny of it because we turned around an entire community, and it showed when, we were, when it was all said and done. And then what happened was we had – the management abilities, and we had the the ability to start building our systems. We ha- we hired a full time leasing agent. We were able to hire the maintenance staff full time. So we went a little bit bigger. But when you go a little bit bigger, these economies of scale start coming into play. You can have a better team. You can start assembling a team, a quality team, because you're going to be able to be able to pay these people. So that's another thing when we talk about you know units that are bigger and you start expanding. You have that ability to actually start hiring better and hiring full-time people. And with this property, we started building our systems. I know it's hard for the listeners out there to imagine, but 
the bigger we get and the bigger we've got, it, my job managing these properties has actually gotten easier because, as Gino said, you're able to hire more people. You're able to put better people in place because you're able to pay them better. So the bigger we've gotten and the better we've done, the easier it, it gets to manage these things. So maybe you know, you're just starting out. You have two units, four units, eight units, whatever it is. Try to buy the biggest deal you can. Get into that deal. If you don't have the money to put down, you have to have a certain skill set, whether it's dealing with tenants, whether it's running a business, whether it's being a handyman. Go out there, put yourself a business plan together, and start and jump into the game. It's never too late to start the game. Once you start, you will be amazed what happens with momentum. If you love it, fantastic. If you hate it, you just sell and you get out. And no worse for the wear, I guess, as, as they say. But you have to find out if you like it. And if you do like it, there's tremendous opportunity in this business. If you have skill, the deals will come. Money is not the problem. It's the deals. If you have great deals yep. and you can put a partnership together, but I know people will not believe this, but it is so true. I mean, right now, people are putting money in the bank at 1%. Uh, they're getting 6 or 7 or 8%, whatever you want to call it, in the stock market. So when you can offer people 10% cash on cash return and this ability to refinance, you'll be able to find money any day of the week. You're just going to have to have a specific skill set. That's why I say to you, when you first start out, take your lumps, learn how to do these deals because you'll be able to get bigger deals, you'll be able to find partners, and you'll be able to bring something to the table to be able to create and to grow and to attract this private money for you to start growing your business. That is a great segue into the next portion of this podcast that I want to discuss and that is to manage or not to manage it's a, it's a very difficult question and Gino was just touching on it when you get in the game it's we started out you know specifically self-managing uh, some people don't want to deal with tenants and, and leaky toilets but it doesn't have to be that way Gino why don't you share a little bit with uh, the viewers out there what a resident manager is and what that person's responsibilities are um, well, I've had a resident manager up here in my properties. Uh, I'm in New York. Uh, basically, you know, resident manager, uh, his responsibilities should be to actually turn the vacant apartments. If there's an apartment that's vacant, he should be able to turn those apartments, get them ready, have him walk around the property, maintain the cleanliness of the property, make sure that everything's clean, everything looks good in the property. Somebody calls up, wants to rent out a place, he should be able to show those vacant apartments. Listen, if you can't show the apartments, you can't secure the deal, then you're never going to fill your apartments. So you have to have a resident manager show those apartments. Then, obviously, he has to run those background checks. Have, have the tenants fill out the forms. Have them hand out the forms. That's crucial. Um, as you can see, guys, all this seems like a lot. But once you have that system built down and you train your resident manager, you can hire and fire the guys if, you're not, if they're not performing and you have a system in place, the next resident manager comes in and off to the races. He has a system in place. The next thing, which I think is pretty important, they have to oversee the contractor work. They have to be on top of whoever's turning the apartment, whoever's doing the painting, whoever's doing the driveway work. He has to oversee that work, uh, come back to you and say, listen, we got these bids. I like this guy. Let's go with him. He has to oversee that work. And, you know, one of the last things I think that they have to do is, you know, they have to deal with the tenant issues and the maintenance of the property. So if somebody starts crawling, going up to him and crying about an issue, he has to deal with that issue. He should bring it to your attention if something's serious. But if not, he should be dealing with the tenants one-on-one. -on -one. It should be a buffer between you and the tenants right. if you have a resident manager on there. Right. So if you get yourself in a position where you're, you're going to buy 20 <laughs> units or more, I would say that's a, that's a good t place. Maybe 10, but if you get up to about 20 units, you may want to start thinking about, okay, this is a good opportunity for me to hire a resident manager. And that's going to be your manager on the property. They're going to show the property. They're going to rent out the units for you. They're going to take the phone calls. That's going to be your, the buffer between you and the tenant. So when people come up to you and say, oh, you're renting apartments? You must be crazy. you got people calling you talking about leaky sinks and leaky toilets. It's not how it works. When The bigger you get, the more people you have in between you and the tenants, and it gives you that buffer, and you're actually running a business. You're not taking phone calls in the middle of the night to uh, address those issues. So that's how, if you, you want to self-manage, you can put a resident manager in place and start to build your business that way. Now, Jake, how do you compensate the resident manager? Everyone's wondering, what's this going to cost me? You know, there's a million different ways to do it. Um, there's, there's sometimes, yep. you know, it's, it's really, it's really your call. At the end of the day, you could pay them a set fee, say 
$500 a month and you could uh, also offer them an apartment. Uh, there's there's different things that people do to compensate uh, resident managers. That's that's sort of one of the things that you're just going to have to feel out in your market, see what other people are doing, and find you know out what's going to work for you. I just want to put this one caveat out there: if you decide to hire a resident manager and he's going to live on your property and he's going to live for rent free, one word of caution: that might be rent free to him, but that is actually considered income to him. So if you're going to be legal and do things on the up and up. He should be issued a 1099 for that rental income because that is income to him, even though he's because he's not paying, he's paying zero for that apartment. That's that should be classified as income to him. Now, if you want to classify him as an employee or a 1099, an independent contractor, that's something you have to speak to your accountant about. The only thing I can say about that is if you have a resident manager living there and that's his only form of employment and you're telling him you have to be on the job from nine to five, you have to do this, you have to do that, you're controlling his employment, then he is an employee. But if he's got another job where he's running around, he's a maintenance guy, he's a handyman, he's cutting grass, and you're not telling him, listen, you can do the job whatever you have to, uh, you're giving him leeway, then I think he tends to fall under, under the independent contractor and you can 1099 him. But just make sure before you do any of this to actually get in touch with your accountant and with your attorney and find out what is best for you. Uh, one more thing I'd like to say about uh, hiring a resident manager, have some type of employee handbook, have some type of rules and regulations that he can follow so that some, something does happen, you're at least covered. You know, have, Let him know the laws and the rules of the land and how you're running your operation. Yeah, and just remember, this is now a business. You you got a resident manager in place. You have other contractors that you're going to be using. You're going to have to market, so you're going to have to get a website. You're going to have to use Rent Links, uh, which is a great site that pushes uh, your your advertising out to multiple rent websites. Uh, maybe a Facebook page. Maybe it's time to start looking at a, a professional bookkeeper. You're going to have to do background checks and start putting those fees in place that we talked about and repositioning uh, these things from day one. These are the this is the difference between you and the mom and pop, you're going to be creating a professionally run business versus what the mom and pop was doing prior. And at the very least, if you're not going to get a bookkeeper and you want to do it yourself in the beginning, I agree because I've done that before. Get QuickBooks, get some type of simple software for you to use, especially these little properties. Start to learn how to really read an income statement or balance sheet. Start to segregate all the properties you have so you know the performance of each property. So if you have three different properties, they should at least very at the very least be in at least three different LLCs. If you want to put them into one LLC, it depends on the value of them. I would discourage that. But if you have three different properties, you should have the books for three separate properties. Because if you want to sell one of the properties or refinance one of the properties, you have the numbers. Also, numbers say everything. If for one month you're doing ten thousand a month in rent, and the next month you're doing seven thousand. If everything's mishmash and you don't know what's going on, you won't be able to track the performance of your property. You won't know that you didn't collect three rents or that you were late or there's three vacancies. Do yourself a favor. Start out from the very beginning. Start segregating every property and do books for every single property so you know that you're hitting your targets every month. 100%. That's, that's really good. So option one, hire a resident manager. Option two would be to hire a property management company. Gina, why don't you, you discuss some of the different uh, things that come along with hiring a property management company? You know, the first thing is <clears throat> people don't like to pay. Me and Jake are two of those kind of people that don't like <laughs> to pay either. <laughs> it's just part of life. But, you know, my dad always used to tell me, you get what you pay for. So if you're going to hire a management company, you're going to have to do a lot of, um, you know, go out and you have to talk to a lot of different companies and see if they're the right fit for you. Don't hire a management company to do multifamilies if they're running single family homes. It's just not the fit for you. If you've got 1,000 units, don't look for a management company that only has 200 units under their belt and vice versa. You, you know, you're starting out, you're going to want a management company that's pretty small, let's say, but they do multis. If you're, if you're focusing on multis or commercial, make sure that the management company is doing the property that you're doing. Make sure that they're going to give you the time and the service that you're, you demand because you're going to be paying them a substantial amount of fees. I can go over the fees really quickly for you. I own duplexes up in Rochester. <clears throat> a duplex uh, costs me 12% of the gross rents, of gross rents collected. Now, when the property goes vacant, they also charge me the $600 a month or the $550 a month, whatever the apartment costs to rent out. Um, but with that management fee that they're charging, um, 
the neighborhood's a little bit more challenging, so there's a substantial amount of work involved. Management companies do a lot of work for the amount of money that they get, they get paid. Um, they do this because I think in the long run, when they end up selling properties, they get listings, so they're, they're in that part of the business also. So the management company is there. I think they're generating cash flow through these, through these fees. They're not getting rich off because there's a lot of work. So the duplexes, single-family homes, between 10 and 12% of gross gross fees, not including security deposits. I'm talking about whatever rent they collect, whatever laundry income they collect, whatever other fees they collect, they take a gross of that. Um, anything 20 units, from 20 units to 50 units, uh, I would say between 8 and 10%, Jake. Does that sound normal in our market? I would say probably closer to 10, but yeah, you're probably in that 10% range at least. You know, and then, you know, as you get bigger, you're obviously going to start paying less. I've seen, you know, in markets that have 100 units, they're paying 3% of uh, management fees. But then what happens is they have a couple leasing agents on on uh, payroll, so they pay the leasing agents from there. So it all depends on your market. It's market-specific. Call a couple different management companies. Go on irem.org, irem.org. Look for management companies on that website. Start calling a few up see what they charge, but also see what services they offer. You want a company that's going to do soup to nuts for you. You have collections. You want them to send it to collections. You have evictions. You want them to run your ship for you properly. And it goes back to the I'm a mentality. You can do sort of what Gino and I do where we we hire employees to manage our properties for us, and we have more oversight and more uh, involvement in terms of what's getting spent and what's not. Uh, if you if you're into multiple, if you have a you know a main job and you're into other businesses, maybe the management company is the way to go for you, simply because you don't have the time, but you want to acquire the assets and start to build your portfolio. We tried to lay out a couple different options that we know uh, people are using, and some sort of you know some of the pros and some of the cons. Management company is great because it's somewhat turnkey. You put it in place, and you just look at your reports every month. The cons are you don't have your hand involved as much. You don't know necessarily what's what things are being spent on a day-to-day basis, and fees and expenses can creep on you. I think that's one of the fears and the legitimate concerns that people have with management companies. Well, that's the thing. If you're not buying the property right, these management company fees can actually eat into your bottom line, and they can really hurt you. Um, you know, that's one of the things. I mean, there's there's certain signs that you have to look for when when hiring a management company, and those excessive fees are there. You have to be in line. Don't cheap out and say that oh, what you know, this guy's the market is eight percent, and this guy's only getting four percent. They're going to resent that. They're not going to do the right job for you. So make sure that you're paying whatever the market is actually demanding. Um, that's truly truly important. Um, you know the other thing with managing companies, you know, it's very difficult when you're not on site to actually trust a person to go in and say, you know what, did you change that smoke detector? You got a bill for sixty bucks. Well, I mean, it might be a fake repair. You don't know. You have to have you know that that confidence and the faith that they're actually doing the job. That's another problem that I see that people have problems with managing companies. Another one is empty apartments. How do you know the apartment's empty? Um, you know, in our properties, we take no cash. We don't want cash in the apartments. We want checks. Um, so you have 20 units. All of a sudden, you see this apartment number three has been empty for the last three months. Is it really empty or is it not empty? You know, that's a, that's a tough call. You're going to have to, you know, live with that. You're going to have to go down and check Make every now and again, make a spot inspection. Just fly on down or drive down or whatever your situation is. Go in there and take a look. See if there's utility turned on to that apartment. See if somebody is living there. Have the person next door go and knock on the door, see if somebody's there. Um, That's a tricky one for people. Fake repairs. Touched on that. Empty apartments. But also, what uh, what if they're not performing? What if the management company is not performing? You bought a mom and pop and they are keeping things the status quo and they're not filling up the vacant units. That's a legitimate concern, and that could really come back to to bite you because you don't have your hand involved in the marketing. You don't necessarily uh, know what's going on there, so the management company is in place, and they're not filling the vacant units up. What do you do in that circumstance? That brings me to a great point that I should have alluded to earlier. When you sign the contract with the management company, make it a month-to-month contract. Don't make a year contract because if you want to get out, you're screwed. And vice versa, if they want to leave you, 
<laughs> they sort of can't leave you, you know? So, you know what? It should be based on performance. Have it month to month. So within 30 days, you can get out. And another thing, guys, I've heard this scenario, and this is crazy, but make sure that you have access to your money. Make sure that when you open up a bank account, that is your bank account that they're putting money into. You don't want the money going into their bank account and you have no access to it until they disperse it to you. Because what happens is if they fold up shop or they decide not to pay you or you get into some legal battle, you're not going to get your money. And that's not a fair scenario, but that's happened a lot. So make sure that you have control of your own money. That's really important. You know, uh, another thing that I've seen with managing companies and even our resident manager, you know, they have slow turns. Sometimes there's no impetus, although there should be because they're working – based on revenue, on what they're generating. If it's taken them four weeks to turn an apartment, which should take four days, you're losing 25 days of revenue at 600 bucks a month. You're losing $500 of revenue for the month. You know, at 10%, they're losing 50 bucks. You're losing 450. So that slow turn is killing the both of you. So you just be careful that they're not taking their time doing these turns. You want to get the turns done as quickly as possible. You know, there's one more thing that I see with managing companies. Sometimes they have this slow rent collection. You need to get, uh, we call it our weekly report. You want to have a report done weekly as far as what, how much rent is being collected, when it's being collected, who's being laid on the property. You, you need to have that report because you want to track them and make sure that everything is getting done properly. Yeah, it's very important because they could be slacking. And then, you know, the month goes quick, 30 days done. And then you didn't hit your numbers for the month, so that that will uh, you know have the income down, expenses going up, and zero profit at the end of the month. So this is great. This is called managing the manager. What happens is you've had this. I think you you can call it a paradigm shift. All of a sudden, you're not a landlord anymore. You're not cleaning the toilets. You are managing an asset, and everyone I think forgets what they're buying into when they're buying real estate. They think they're buying property. They're not buying property. I I like to call it, they're buying an income stream. They're buying a vehicle to take them from point A to point B, that rate of return. Now, what I love about real estate, that vehicle is awesome. We can go into so many different variables why. Amortization pay down, cash flow, cost segregation, that vehicle is awesome, but that's all it is. It's just a vehicle. So as you can see, the management company, hiring management company, you you need this certain mind shift, and you just have to think about it. It's really a business. It's not about property. It's about generating that income stream, getting those yields on the property, and a management company can you make you hit those targets. So that's a lot that we've covered. We've covered manage right which essentially to us is meeting out or surpassing our specific income and expense numbers. And we, we start by doing that by filling the vacant units at market rents, implementing rubs, and raising the remaining tenants to market. We then discussed to manage or not to manage, the pros and the cons. That's something that you guys are going to have to decide for yourself, but we hope we laid out the differences between the two. Gino, anything else? No, all I just want to say is I'm psyched. We did a great call tonight. Hope you guys got a lot of value out of it. I can't wait to do the next call next week. Uh, We're going to jump on. We're going to do a call on our third leg of our framework, Finance Right. Um, It's a little more technical than this one. Uh, I think this one is more dealing with running your business. You're going to see that this is the wheelbarrow, the wheel of the wheelbarrow. So this is in constant motion managing, right? So it's very important that you get this done, that you start building out your systems and you just start rocking and rolling. Absolutely. We hope we provide a value for you folks tonight. We'll talk to you on the Finance Right Call. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Take care. We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.